I want to greet everybody that's watching by means of YouTube. We're glad to have you tonight as well as the rest of you. We're looking in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11 tonight. And the title of the message is, In Times Like These. You know, there was, there's a song in our songbook that says, In Times Like These, boy, we need the Bible. Amen. And uh, in times like these, oh, be not idle. And so the times, and you might, you, might be, you might be tempted by the title like that in times like these to say, well, what time is it? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. And, uh, but it just says, uh, it, it just says this, <clears throat> the times, these are the last days. You know, these are the last days of which we are and have been in for some time. And they are described by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Listen to this. They're, they're described as perilous times, as proud times. When you can't tell anybody anything in order to instruct them or help them. These are perverted times. And these are powerless times, it seems like. And, uh, and, and Paul said this, so This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Those are the narcissists. I mean, don't we live in the age of the selfie? What's that all about? God, it's all, it's all, you got to get me in here. It's all about, it's all about self. We just don't think about it. But that's what it is. There's a lot of narcissism out there, right? Hey, what have you done for me lately? Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. And we have so much of that without natural affection. We have so much of that. It's rampant in our land. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. That means they can never be satisfied. Incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Listen, I talked to someone this week, it was yesterday evening, and they were asking some questions about the church, and I, and I said, listen, we still sing out of hymn books, and I said, I don't have stuff up on the walls, and we don't have, we're not a car wars church, although I raise my hand in church and so forth. I said, because we're not in the entertainment business. You know, you want to go to a theater, you want to go to a show or whatever, that's the place to be entertained. But a church is a place where we're to be edified. That means to be built up in our faith, that we can go another mile, that we can continue on and be used of God and do what God has called us to do. That the church has been, that the church is able to do what God has, has invested in us to do. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth, and we're to disseminate that locally, nationally, and globally. And that's why there are those missionary letters there on the back wall. And so these are the times. And so what are we supposed to do? How are you and I supposed to live in times such as this? Well, they're right here. Peter prayed about this, and he illustrates, he enumerates for us what these things are. Look in verse 7 with me. But the end of all things is at hand. You know, people, they thought the Lord Jesus was coming in their day. Why? Because the end times, the end times, the last days actually started, if you will, on the day of Pentecost. Remember when, the, when they want to know what was happening there on the day of Pentecost? Peter said, this is what was written in Joel. He said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit. So it started back then. They all thought, they all believed in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this church age is a part of the last days. And I really think that if I had a chart up here and if I were to draw it out, I'd put a little mark like where the where the where the tribulation period begins and we're like right there, right up butted up against it. It could be at any moment that the Lord could come back for the body of believers. I believe the Bible teaches that. And these are the last of the last of the last days. And so he said, the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So one of the things that I put down here that speaks to me is that you and I are supposed to be prayerful. We're to be a praying people. The Lord Jesus expected us. He said, and when you pray. All right. So he was already, he was already assuming. He was already anticipating that we were going to be men and women of prayer. 
And so be prayerful. And the times alone should be enough to crowd us to Christ and not to cast away our confidence in the things of God. Look at verse 12. Same chapter. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. For us to go through trials, for us to have valleys, for us to have difficulties is a part of the Christian experience. Being a Christian doesn't exempt me from problems. Listen, lost people tonight have problems. Some of the big houses around here, they got problems by the square foot. Amen. They might have a big house and there's trouble on the inside there. And so it doesn't matter what you're living in. Amen. That doesn't exempt you. Having a lot of money. I mean, look what happened to the bank in California. Having all that money in the bank, not doing them much good right now. It's, you know what we would say? We would say, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. It's just a memory. And, uh, and it, you know, some of them are going to get it back and a lot of them are not. But my point, is, my point is this, that the times alone should be enough to crowd us to Christ. And so, so notice what he said, we're to be sober. And that means to be serious-minded about the times in which we are in. And so as a result, listen, peace is not found in a liquor bottle or a pill bottle. Listen, they used to say there's no hope in dope, and that's true. Well, that was in the 60s when, when I was a boy. Some of y'all were... Some of y'all. We're here ahead of me, all right? And some of y'all are just trying to catch up. But there was no hope in dope. And they'll wind up, listen, you drink that bottle down and you're just as empty as the bottle. It doesn't make anything go away. It doesn't do that. And so we don't need an escape. What we need is to be endued. That word endued simply means to be invested with a gift or a quality about our life. Grace, peace, and long-suffering from on high, and that only comes by drawing nigh to God. The scripture says in the book of James in chapter 4, if we'll not draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us. Listen, when he, listen, he saved us for fellowship. He is to be our shield, our high tower, our buckler, our strength. And he is all those things and more. But we need to be near him. You know, the shepherd in, in days gone by, the Old Testament shepherd, he had a staff. And you know, and, and if you were within the length of that staff, you were going to be well protected from the things that were on the outside. And so it was always the sheep that are on the edge or the sickly at the back that were always subject to problems and subject to being taken by the wolves. And so, beloved, you and I, we need to be in close proximity, if you will, to the shepherd. Now, when I say draw nigh, we're not talking about geographically, but we are talking about spiritually. And when you and I are in the prayer closet, there's no room for strutting in there. What does it require to draw nigh to God? It requires humility. That's a choice. We humble ourselves and say, Lord, this life is more than I can handle on my own. Even the Lord told, told Elijah, he said that the journey is too great for thee. And it's too great for us. It requires submission. That what, and what that simply means is to be yielded and submitted to the known will of God. Do your best in that area. If you read something from the Bible, put it into practice. You know, practice what we say we believe. And that should have an impact. In other words, you know, I, I've been in a lot of homes where the Bible's on the coffee table, but it's just a conversation piece. It's not really something that people actually read or believe or put into practice. You know, we had one, we had one in, in our house when I was growing up, and it had, the, it had that whole big... That had that big, uh, you know, with a compass and the G in the middle. It had all that stuff. It was a Masonic Bible. And my parents, my dad wasn't a Mason. I don't know where that Bible came from. I don't know. I, I didn't know anything about the Masons then. Don't really care to know much, know anything about it now. I'm just saying that we had that, but nobody, nobody was doing what the Bible said. It just was there like, like how we put flowers in here to make it look nice. It was just a decoration was never a doctrine, never a discipline. And so, beloved, we need to have these things, grace, peace, and long-suffering from on high. And, on, you know, and in these days, and you say, well, man, Brother Ed, I, I just don't know. I, got, I don't know if I have time for this. Listen, there's a song they wrote. You know the title of that song, Little is Much When God is in it? Do you remember that? There's a verse in there that says, 
Are you laid aside from labor, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle in the sacred place of prayer. And then the chorus says, little is much when God is in it. And so we all can have that prayer ministry. So like I said, there's no room for strutting in the prayer closet. And those in, we should be praying for those in authority that we might lead that quiet and peaceable life. And we need to be praying for one another. I, I, I'm not fussing at you. I'm just trying to provoke you and put you in remembrance of some things. Why? Because if we get to this age, there's so many things that pull on us, so many things that want to distract us, so many things that are competing for our thoughts and our time and our dollars and our strength, so many of these things. And yet so much of that, what we need, we could find being supplied in the prayer closet, spending time with God. I hope you have a place where you can do that, a quiet place. It might be a porch. Uh, maybe you're sitting on the back porch under the carport. It, it, it might be, hey, you know, sometimes I know people just sit in the car. They get to the job a little bit early. They have some time there in the front seat of their vehicle. And they're going to read their Bible. and They're going to have a time of prayer and they're going to get along with God. You know, I, I remember doing some of those things and having to take time and have, I thank God I have an office. I have a place that I can go to, but that's not the only place that I pray. Yeah. But be prayerful. That's what he said, watch into prayer. Well, Peter must have known something about why. Look, look what happened to Peter, all the things that occurred to him in, in his life, that he was so impulsive and did so many things without necessarily thinking first or talking to God first. And we got a lot of Peter in us. Those knee-jerk reactions that if we would spend a little time with God and say, well, no, I don't know what's going on and I don't know what to do. Would you guide me? Would you help me? Would you strengthen me? Man, listen, did, did, you get, did you ever get upset when your children came to you with a legitimate question and asked you about something? Probably not. You know, don't you want your children to be wise? I'm sure you do. Your grandchildren, yeah, you want them to be wise. Well, God wants his children to be wise also. And that means going to him and asking him. You know, uh, I... I there's a, I have a friend that was a missionary and his son, you know, I told this, I told this story to the men's Sunday school. And so the, the, you guys just have to bear with a repeat. All right. And so anyway, but I, you know, he didn't have one of those chain guards. And so he got his pant leg caught in the sprocket and uh, in the chain. And of course, in getting his pant leg out of there, the chain came off. So, I mean, he was, he's probably about eight years old. And he said, he flipped that bicycle upside down. His dad is watching him through the front window. And, uh, and so the boy is trying to put that chain on. He starts over there and gets over here. And about every time he does, poop, it comes off. And he, try, he tried it many, many times. And finally he said that little boy just looked at that bicycle, put his foot up and kicked it right over just like that. And, and, and the dad said to him, so he said, man, if he, said, if he would have just come in and asked me, I would have helped him. And he said, right away, the Lord spoke to his heart. He said, son, you do the very same thing. He said, if you just come to me, I would help you in your problems. Listen, beloved, I, man, I love to hear about answered prayer, don't you? Why? It encourages me, man. If God's hearing them, answering them, he's going to do that for me. And he will do it for you. So I'm encouraged by it. Be prayerful. Look at verse 8. Not only be prayerful, but be charitable. Be charitable. Look at verse 8. And above all things, above all things, look what he's, of all the things he could have told them in preparation for suffering, he might have said, man, be sure to put away a few canned goods. Be sure you got enough water put up. Be sure you got a place to hide up. Make sure you got a place where those Roman soldiers don't know where you are and where you can hide out and be safe. He could have said oh, all those things, get all that stockpile, be a real doomsday prepper. But that's not what he said. He said, above all things, he said what? Have fervent charity. You know what the word fervent means? It's the same word that they use, the effectual fervent prayer. When you do something with a fervor, it, it's, almost like, it's almost like boiling up. I, I had a partner, uh, and David knows who that is, and it was Donald Smith. And I remember we were working on this little girl had been caught in a, she had been locked inside of a truck and had seized so much she couldn't seize anymore. And so we're doing external cooling. We're trying to do all that. And man, we try to, we asked for a helicopter in, and uh, this is out East 105 and so forth. And man, we're doing all this stuff and, and, you know, dispatch, boy, they're calling, they're calling, they're calling. And finally, Donald, you know, Donald's got all this stuff going and I'm working, trying to get a line. I got these bags in the girl and he just picked up, I'm busy. 
put the thing back down. And we went to work. Now that's fervency. If you worked with Donald, you know he could be fervent. That was fervency. And, uh, and so this have, have what? You notice what it said. Above all things, have fervent charity. When I was a kid, I liked to watch, I'd like to go where they were building houses. It just used to be fields where I grew up. And uh, I got out there, you know, and I told you about riding that bulldozer with that guy. And I was just a little fella, eight, eight or nine years old by that time. Houses going up. And back in those days when they put in the plumbing, you know, it wasn't PVC pipe. It was cast iron pipe. And, uh, and they would put oakum. Y'all know what oakum is? There are older people here. Man, it, this is such a blessing that I can use things that you all know what I'm talking about. I, do you know what oakum is, brother? G good. All right. Oakum is like a type of... It was like a type of rope uh, material like that, like what you might find maybe stuffed inside of an old cushion before they came out with foam rubber and stuff. But they would put that oakum in there in that little empty spot, and he would always have a fire over here with a blowtorch, and he had a little cauldron, and in there was lead. So when he put the oakum in the place, then he would pour that lead around that and seal that joint. Well, a lot of times they would, they, would, they would spill that in the process of doing that. And so as a kid, we didn't know anything about lead poison. We didn't care. Man, I'd just go in there and scrape that stuff up. Man, I'd play with it, do all, do all kinds. That's probably what my problem is today. Yeah. <laughs> but my point is, is that lead, when I watch it, it never, it never looked like it had boiled. It was soft. It was yielded, but it just laid there. That's not fervent. Fervent charity, it's active. And he said, above all things, have fervent charity. Charity is a defining mark of true discipleship. Listen to this, John 13. It says, a new commandment I give unto you. The Lord Jesus here is speaking. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. And that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It is the mark, it is a distinguishing mark of true discipleship. As someone who belongs to the Lord Jesus by, by grace through faith. It is, that, it, is that, it is that defining mark, I should say, of discipleship. Charity is also the most distinguished mark of Christ's likeness. Listen to this. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. And the greatest of these is charity. Why? Because charity can do so many things. It's the greatest power on the planet. You see, charity is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action word, an action word for God. So loved the world that what? He gave. It motivated him to give. Love is what causes you, you know, listen, love is what, I remember when Debbie was expecting and I, I cut this little thing out of the newspaper and it said what love is. And it was a little cartoon character. Do you remember this thing? It was a little cartoon character and this, and this girl, she, this wife, she was pregnant and the husband was down there tying her shoes because she couldn't see her feet anymore. And said, that's what love is. It wasn't fawning over him and all that. No, it was, it was something that was in action. You know, a missionary one time said it was love with shoes on. That's the kind of love he's talking about here. That we ought to have one toward another. And not just in our assembly, he said, among yourselves. But that also goes outside of these walls. It's how people will know that we really are the disciples of Christ. How we really belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. By the love that we have for one another. And that includes those who are even outside the body. As we have opportunity. Be charitable. Giving and forgiving. Are just a couple of expressions. Of charity. Of true charity. Giving and forgiving. Think about it. In the times that I read about. Man, these are stressful times for a lot of people. Strains. Some people, man, I, I, still, I still am amazed at the people that still wear masks as I see them here in Kerrville and they're sitting in the car by themselves. I, you know, you're not going to talk them out of it. 
I, I don't I don't bother to try it. I see some old man, they go in and out of the store, they still got their mask on and they're still doing all these things. And man, I try you know, like you try to tell them, you know, you're not going to create an ICU by putting a piece of cloth over your face. Anywhere that you have mucosa that's open, like your eyes, you're susceptible to everything. So that's just eye wash, is all that is. And particularly when you're by yourself. Anyway, I won't say what I think sometimes about that. But, but because of this, remember that there was, a, there was a lot of depression. There were a lot of problems that caused other problems, people to take their own life and so forth that, that happened during the COVID times. Because why? Cabin fever. You know, we're, we're really not meant to... Listen, it was a long time in the prison system for, the, for prisons to understand that when you put a man in solitary confinement, you just were basically signing a death warrant for him because mentally he was shot. If he, went, if he stayed down there any length of time, they just came out, they couldn't adjust, they couldn't re-socialize, they couldn't do any of that. Why? Because their brains were fried in the isolation. We're not meant to be that way. That's why God, in part, I think, put the church here to help us. So we can fellowship with one another. So we have opportunity to see one another. I remember that what the COVID did. We were so glad to see everybody. I mean, we were desperate. Even the kids back at East River, they took they took paper plates and they did with crayons and they drew a bunch of faces on those things and then and then pasted them on the pews so that Brother Hoots wouldn't have to look at empty pews. They were paper plates, but it looked like people out there. And when we were able to get back together, man, what that meant. Didn't, didn't it feel good when y'all got back together and said, man, we're going to have church. We're going to worship it. And when somebody walked in, man, I, I'm, I'm so happy to see you. That's charity. Charity. Maybe they're living in close quarters. Their fears and frustrations still get the best of them. They're just not themselves. And you and I, we can have something to do with helping them. You know, charity, the Bible says, covers a multitude of sins. Look, look, at, the, look at the latter part of verse 8. Have perfect charity among yourselves. What? For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now listen. Charity does not tolerate evil. Don't get me wrong about that. Listen, it's not looking the other way. There's a lot of that that gets practiced today. Bad behavior. We just look the other way. No, that, that, that's not charity. But charity will help a person to cover their shame. Do you remember when Noah was found naked? What did those boys do? What did Shem and Japheth do? They turned their backs around and they brought a blanket and they covered their father. They didn't point their finger at him. They didn't put down on him. They just went and covered him. And that's what real charity does. It covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't condone what happened. But at the same time, it's not going to make it worse. It's going to cover it and do what they can to help them move on and get it. What, what, is, what is Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 say? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual do what? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Why? Considering thy own self, lest thou also be tempted. That word restore is like when a, when a, when a shoulder has become separated. It's a bone. A, it's a joint that's out. It's displaced. And you want to put it back in. Why? So that it can function again and be pain free. And that's what we do when we see charity sees its brother and it stumbles and we want to pick it up. And we have to ask ourselves, what kind of church do we want to be? You know, there were churches, there were churches in Antioch and there were churches in Jerusalem. And the churches in Jerusalem, boy, they hoarded everything. They kept it all here and they kept it in here all like this. And the church in Antioch said, man, the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas, for the work where unto I've called them. And what did they do? They sent out missionaries. They sent out people. And when, when a dirt came, when a, when a famine came, they had the means and wherewithal from the blessings of God to help those back in Jerusalem who were hoarding it and trying to keep it here. Now, I think we're doing a good job on our missions and so forth. But what I'm saying is, is that, is that in that capacity, we have to ask ourselves, do I want to be a Jerusalem church or do I want to be an Antiochian church that sees a need and then does something about it? And as we're able, remember what the scripture says? Hey, don't withhold good from them to whom it is due, to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. And I thank you for your willingness. I do. A church, I commend you for it, your willingness to help Brother Byer. We've done so a couple times in addition to our support, and we've doubled his support. I thank God for you. I do. I love that. To be a part of a giving church, man, what a difference that makes. And God, I, 
I'm telling you, God, we, we're just never going to outgive him. Amen. And you can't invest too much in good men and their families. So, so why, does, why does charity cover that shame? It's because one of the things in 1 Corinthians 13, it says it bears all things. That means it gets up underneath the load of that pressure and holds it and holds it. Be prayerful. Be charitable with each other. That means having patience. That means, that means going the extra mile. That means putting yourself at risk. Usually when people get hurt, what do they do? They withdraw. I'm not going to go out there and do that again because I got hurt. That man, God has called us to vulnerability. What if the Lord Jesus would have felt that way? Man, I'm not going, I'm not going through Samaria. They don't like me over there. I'm not going through. They don't like me over there. What? And we, would, we wouldn't have what we have today. We still be men and women, boys and girls in our sin. Be charitable. Number three, be hospitable. Be hospitable. Look at verse nine. Use hospitality. Now listen, I didn't write the book. I'm just delivering the mail. Amen? Use hospitality. What does that mean to be hospitable? It just means to, it just means to show a, a desire to express some care. In other words, hospitality would be one of those things that charity is going to produce. One of the things that, that a pastor is supposed to be, he's supposed to be a lover of good men and hospitable. The thing in 3 John, when they were there, they said, man, John wrote and said, listen, there, there were three men, Gaius, and there was Diotrephes, and there was someone else. And Gaius was the pastor. Di Diotrephes was, was the man that loved to have the preeminence. And so whenever a missionary came along, he wanted to put him out of the assembly. And John said, I'm going to take care of him when I get to town. Amen. That's what he was going to do. He was going to deal with it. And so I, I thank God for that. And so when we help someone along their lake, like what we've done for Brother Byer and what you all have done for others be before I came here, man, God remembers those things in our hospitality. It makes such a great difference. You remember the man that went down the Jericho Road? Remember that guy? He fell among thieves. And what happened to him? He got down there, man, and it looks like he was unconscious to me when he's laying down there. And here come two fellas. They walk down the road and they see this guy laying out in the street. And, uh, and what are they, the, the first one is the priest and he represents religion. And the priest looks at that and says, man, well, he sure, he sure had no business being down here on the Jericho Road. Well, look where the priest was. He was on the Jericho Road. And up to him and said, well, man, I can't help him. That's too bad. And he just walked on. Then the Levite comes along. He represents the law. And the law never was able to heal anybody. The law would just diagnose. And he would look at him. He said, yeah, he's, he looks like he's DRT. That means dead right there. But he wasn't. And so now who comes along? Now the Samaritan comes along. And man, he goes over to him. And immediately he goes into action. And takes care of him. That's hospitality. And what did he do? He did it and he takes the guy to the inn and said, listen, I'm going to give you a little bit now to cover the expenses and I'll pay the rest when I come back. What a picture of the Lord Jesus in doing so. You see that, that religion, it's empty, it's sanctimonious, which just means that it's all about ceremony, but no substance. In other words, it talks a good talk, but it never puts anything into action. Beloved, we don't want to be that way. And, and the Levite, representing the law, there's no mercy in the law. There's only judgment. Well, what was he doing down here? Well, he's getting what he deserved. He shouldn't have been down here. He wouldn't have been amongst them thieves. He'd have kept what he had. And he just moved on. And he walked on. That's not being hospitable. The good Samaritan did what needed to be done and did so without reservation. Without reservation. How many of y'all know who Edgar Guest was Edgar Guest was a poet at the end of the 19th century, Brother Larry, wrote some great stuff, great stuff. And uh, if you have a Kindle account, man, a lot of his books are free. I think you'd like that too, brother. You would like it. When I found out they were free, man, I'm click, zip, download it, click, zip. Yeah, I'd like to have that one too, click. But one of those poems, it, it goes, it's called, it, the, the poem is entitled Creed. Something that he was going to live by. And I just took an excerpt out of it. He said, let me be a little kinder. Let me be a little blinder to the faults of those around me. Let me praise a little more. 
meaning that when someone has done something good or well that you compliment them, you encourage them. Let me praise a little more. To be all that I should be, let me be a little meeker with the brother that is meeker, with weaker, excuse me. I'm going to read that. Let me be a little meeker with the brother that is weaker. Let me think more of my neighbor and a little less of me. Boy, you remember, you remember, you remember the story of Charlotte's Web? Kids' story. Say, is that what you read on Tuesdays, brother? A kid's story. Sometimes, because there's an illustration in there sometimes. Do you remember, do you remember who Templeton was? Who remembers who Templeton was? Charlotte's Web, brother, you need to read it. It would help you, all right? Charlotte's Web, it's all about a pig, right? And Charlotte is a spider. I know ladies, you all don't like spiders, but, but what did she do? Charlotte put the name of that pig in her web, spun it out there, and that pig, and they were going to butcher the pig and all this kind of stuff, and the rest of the farm animals there, they were all trying to figure out how can we save the pig? How can we help the pig, all right? And, uh, and so they really needed something, and they needed Templeton, and guess what? Templeton was a rat, you know, Buck two long tail rat. You know, you have those around barns and things. A lot of times they get in there. And so and so they came to Templeton. Templeton, we were near this. And you know what Templeton said? He said, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And that's how some people are. I'll help you, but what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? Oh, beloved, we don't want to be that way. Amen. If the Lord looked at what's in it for me, gosh, aren't you glad he didn't look at it that way? The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he went to Calvary. Bless his name. Amen. Amen. For the joy that was set before him. And man, I, you know, I bet you he's going to have some joy when we get home. Amen. I know there's going to be. Last thing. Be prayerful. Be charitable. Be hospitable. Last thing. Verse 10 and 11. Be reliable. Be reliable. <laughs> Notice what it says, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You know what? We have been given many things. And one of the things that God requires of stewards is that they be faithful. God wants us to be a good steward of the manifold grace of God. That manifold is like the multicolored, you know, kind of like when light goes through a prison, what does it do? You used to do that as a kid. You put them up there. Man, what do you do? You shine it on the wall and you got all the colors of the spectrum. And so to God wants us to be like that and to use those gifts as believers. We're to be good stewards of the grace of God. We've been given so many things. We've been given gifts on the day that you got saved. You know that salvation is by repentance and faith. It's not by coming up in the church. You know, you could be raised in a garage and that wouldn't make you a car. You know, my grandmother was a librarian. That doesn't mean, you know, that I would know how to read just because my grandmother was a librarian. I had to learn about that, how to read. And my point is, is that the way a person when, what goes to heaven when they die is they place their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not religion. It's a relationship. And in that relationship, when a person trusts Christ, God, through the Holy Spirit, gives us gifts, either one or more. And he wants us then in the remainder of our life to let that gift develop so we can use it for the glory of God and the good of others. You, you may not be say, well, I'm not gifted. Don't say that because that's not true. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you have a gift. It might be the ministry of helps. It might be the gift of giving. It might be the gift of administration. You know how to rule though. You know how to organize. You know how to do some of those things. Not everybody has those things. And no one person like the pastor possesses all those gifts. That's why we are a body. A body. God believes in the body principle, David. He does. Man, you know, if everybody were the ear, then who's going to do the seeing? <clears throat> the body principle. And so we're to be good stewards of that grace of God. And we have access to that. And so we have been given these gifts and we're responsible for what we do with them. So we have to be reliable as, as good stewards. And then look at, look at verse Look at verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. The oracles of God, that is about the scriptures. We need to be reliable, beloved, in practicing the grace of God in our lives toward other people in these times, in these difficult times. It might be the only source of grace they're going to get to have. 
You might be the only help they're ever going to get of meaningful in their life. Another one is here is be scriptural. Be scriptural. Notice what it says. If any man, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So what are you saying? What I'm saying is this, that listen, there is a famine in the land of biblical truth. There is a famine in the land. I, I told this person that I was speaking about, remember what I said they, about entertainment versus edification? I said, we don't have a praise team. We don't, we're not doing all that. I'm not going to have somebody up here bouncing around and drums and guitar. I'm not doing that. We're not doing that. And it's not a rock concert. It's a place where we talk about the rock. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Build our lives upon him. I'm not picking on those folks. I'm just saying that there's a lot of stuff that goes on today in the name of God that God doesn't have anything to do. And you say, how do you know that? Because it's not found in the Bible. And Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken. What strengthens people, when you're dealing with people, they need the word of God. Don't make a euphemism out of it. Don't find a softer way to say what God said. Just say it the way that he gave it. Because the Lord said what he meant and he meant what he said. Parents have got to learn that. Grandparents have got to teach their grandchildren that. The grandma and grandpa, they mean what they say and they say what they mean. Yeah, I know what you said, but Brother Ed, they're so cute. I understand. I get that. I know. I, I know that. And, 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 you know, and ladies, I know every baby, oh, they're just so, man, I look at them, they got a little scrunched up face. I, I'm sorry. You know, I like them, you know, a little bit further down the road. I'm just saying society is entertainment oriented and not interested in edification. They want to throw out the doctrine for entertainment and political correctness. I, I feel for you. Those of you that have children here that are here, I feel for you because it's hard to be a parent in the times in which we live. It really is. I mean, you have to be careful where you're going to do parenting. You can't do it in public because somebody will turn you in for doing what the Bible says that you ought to do. You know, my parents, gosh, when we, when we were kids, our parents all had help. In other words, if I ran away from my mom or dad and I was being disciplined, if there was another adult there by, they would snatch me up and bring me over to them and help hold me <laughs> so mom and dad could finish the job. And you know that's so. That was the same way. Hey, if they, or if somebody else saw you, hey, what are you doing? They just, that, what are you doing? Now, you don't belong over there. And uh, does your mama know that you're down here? And then you got on the phone. Sarah, get me. A, it might have been a party line. You know, it might have been something right out of Mayberry or whatever. But you got him on the phone. Hey, I just want you to know, Bobby's down here. Eddie's down here. Mel's down here, doing something. And I saw him. I thought you ought to know. Thank you. They wouldn't be like, "Who do you think you are?" Telling my kids. Yeah. The kids that have problems today, I blame mom and dad. Yeah. Let's put it where it belongs. There's so much confusion and so many lies. What we need in the last days is we need something that is straightforward, truthful. Listen, the book of Ephesians says that I and that we ought to speak the truth in love. But wouldn't it be a shame if we only had love without truth? You can't call that Bible. You can't call that spiritual. You've got to have. It's just like what the Lord Jesus said there in John chapter 4. That the Lord is looking for people to worship him in spirit. And guess what? Truth. That's the balance on it. Listen, I don't mind raising my hand. I don't mind clapping my hand. I don't mind patting my foot to a, to a, a good biblical song based upon. Based that's on, on a doctrinally true. You know, it's like, ring the bells of heaven. Well, where are the bells in heaven? I've never read that. Have you? You say, does that really matter? It might matter to him. Just because somebody put it down on paper doesn't make it so. You say, you're splitting hairs. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to, be, I'm just trying to tell you that if, we, if you start accepting all that stuff, then pretty soon you just start, well, it doesn't, then it doesn't really matter. And it does matter.
It does matter. You know, like all dogs go to heaven. No, they don't. I see that stuff online. My medic friends, oh, they went over on the, on the, they went over on the golden rainbow. Is that what it is? The, the something rainbow? rainbow the rainbow bridge. Thank you. They went on the rainbow bridge, and I just go, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not Bible. And usually those people, they're not interested in what the Bible has to say, but they want to live in that fantasy world, that fairy tale world. Mm -hmm. And beloved, when the chips are down, you're going to want somebody that has the truth. Mm -hmm. And you're going to want to know the truth so that you can help those around you who are going to be upset or concerned or worried. I, I think about I think about those parents, and I'm 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 gonna be done. I'm trying to get unplugged here. I think about those parents who lived in England when the Blitz came. Now, do you know what the Blitz is? The Blitz is when Germany began to bomb the civilian population in England. And they would hear that they would hear that V1 come over. Had just enough fuel to get across the English Channel about 90 plus miles, right, brother? And suddenly it'd be silent. You know when it ran out of fuel? It was all arbitrary. You didn't know where that thing I think there were like a thousand pounds of, of TNT inside of it, and it would detonate and it would destroy homes, and they would all go to what they called the underground. They would go to the subway systems there. And I wonder what those parents were trying to tell their children about what was going on, how they're comforting their child. They, and you know what? They didn't have to have psychologists in the schools after that. <clears throat> Amen, Brother Ed. Amen. They didn't have to have a bunch of model babies and stuff running around. What am I going to do? What am I gonna... That's the generation that's out there getting ready to make decisions. They're going to be voting pretty soon. God, help us. Help us. We need people with the truth. And we have the truth. And so what should we be doing? We should be speaking the truth then with our neighbors. Don't try to schmooze it. Just give it to them the way God said to do it in these last days. Listen, I mean, you know, it talked about we need a word from him just like they do, just the way that he, that he gave it. Don't make, try to make it more palatable. The Holy Spirit knew what he was doing. So are you looking for his coming? And if you are, then we ought to walk and live in the light of that knowledge. Where in these times, you can affect and help the people around you. Even what we're trying to do tonight, even when you come to the house of God, it's to get some help. The Bible is very practical, is it not? Amen. It is. God gave it to us for a reason, to help us to have joy and peace and comfort and hope. Not a maybe but a real confidence, confidence in the one who gave us the Bible. Amen? Amen? Amen. I'm for you tonight. I'm for you. I just want you to think about these things. Hey, you know, just let, let God be God and receive that Bible, receive the word of God with meekness, and it'll help you. It'll deliver you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I sure do thank you for my church family. Thank you for these that are visiting with us tonight, Lord. And I just thank you for your precious Holy Spirit at the word of God that you give to us, Father. Help us to receive it, to believe it, and to put it in practice as best we can by the grace of God. Help us, Lord, with our neighbors, where we work, where we bank, where we pay our bills, amongst our kinfolk, Father. Help us to be a resource and a source of truth. My brother prayed for the church that we would be a beacon of light in, in this city and county. Help us then, Lord, as small lights, to be that beacon in our homes amongst our family and friends. We love you tonight. We need you, Lord, if we're going to do that. We need your power to do it. I pray you'll bless now, Father. Have your way with us. Bless this week, Lord, our people. In Jesus' name, amen.